Hello and welcome to a Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome back to all you regular listeners. Thank you for stopping in and welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It's no accident that you are here today, friend. So please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around for a while and let's see what the, the Lord has for us today. I continue. I can't talk this morning. I continue to pray for all of you regularly, that the Lord will draw you closer to Him and give you more of a desire to know Him, and to know His Word, and that you will be intentional about spending time with Him. Oh, friends, we must. We must be intentional. We have so many distractions from this world, and uh, may we just purpose with God's help, that we are going to set our hearts and our minds on Him more and more each day. It's the only way, friends. It is the only way uh, for us to live this joy-filled, victorious life. It's not anything in us, but it's focusing on the one who provides the joy, who provides the peace, who provides every single thing that we need, the one who works in us to will and to work in us those things for his good pleasure. And it's for his glory, but he does good things for us. He provides everything that we need. Our God is a good, good, loving Father. He's so gracious, so merciful, but He's also just and holy. And if it weren't for His graciousness and His goodness and uh, just the way that He loves us, we wouldn't have a chance. But oh, He does love us so. So may we thank Him for what He's done. May we thank Him for what He's done in sending Jesus uh, to be our Savior. Friends, it's, it makes all the difference, all the difference for eternity. Uh, please consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone who you think may receive a blessing from it. And know, as always, that I love to hear from you. So if you feel so led, send me a message sometime. Well, our verse for the day, for the first day of August, August 1st, 2024, comes from the New Testament letter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. And it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. Now, the main point in what is being said is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Oh, friends, I love this. We're going to think about today the priesthood and that Jesus is our great high priest and what that means for us. And I am so thankful, so thankful that God gave us a great high priest to intercede for us. And so we're going to think about these things today. But first, let's um, think about where we are in the scripture. We are, as I mentioned, in the New Testament. We are in that section of general letters. Remember that the New Testament begins with the four Gospels, then it moves to that uh, New Testament history, that early church history, which is the book of Acts, then into Paul's letters. There's 13 of those that we have written by the Apostle Paul, and then into the general letters. There's eight of those written by men who were not Paul, and then New Testament prophecy, that book of Revelation. Now, you will hear some say that they think that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Hebrews, uh, but we do not know that for sure. And all of Paul's other letters have a very clear um, statement in the greeting, in the introduction about the author, um, and this one doesn't. We know that the writer of the letter to the Hebrews was a believer. We also know that he was a Jew, or it very much seems that he is, because he writes to others whom he calls brethren, and he seems to understand and knows that they seem to understand uh, the law and the Old Testament priesthood and uh, all of those things. And so he is writing to them. I love that he tells us why. He is writing to them. If we hop over to Hebrews chapter 13, and I believe it's verse, 
Oh, 22, he says, But I urge you, brothers, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. He is exhorting them. He is encouraging them with his words. And uh, this book is a very, very, what I would call, meaty book. It um, has just so much. It it goes from just the surface into some of more of the background, into the deeper things. It, he talks about letting us press on to maturity. And as we grow and we build on these building blocks, I mean, we start with knowing that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, and then we know that Jesus loves us so and that God sent him to be our Savior. Uh, but then within this Hebrews, we learn so much more of what he has done. And one of the things that you will see, uh, one of the main themes, and we talk about this frequently when we're in this letter to the Hebrews, uh, is that Jesus is better. I've told you this before when we've been in the, this letter to the Hebrews, and Lord willing, we'll be here a couple more times this month. Um, but when we've been in Hebrews before, I've reminded you that uh, when I first, if you would have asked me maybe four or five years ago, what's Hebrews about? I would have uh, not been able to tell you very much. I would have had this feeling in my um, insides of, oh, there's a lot of stuff there and I don't understand it all. And then I would have thought of, well, there's that uh, Hall of Fame of Faith in chapter 11, the By Faith chapter. I would have uh, probably remembered that uh, Hebrews talks about the Word of God being living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, but I may not have remembered much more. But the the uh, one of the overriding themes throughout, and I hope you can remember this, is that Jesus is better. He's the better everything. And um, in all situations, in all ways, he is better. Um, and the writer of this letter points out at the beginning that he's better than the angels, and then he's better than Moses. He's superior to Moses, which would have made a big deal to those who would have received this uh, letter. He's superior to the law. He's be the better high priest. He's the great high priest. He was the better perfect sacrifice. He is just better, better, better. He was the one time for all sacrifice for everyone. Whereas with the Old Testament uh, Levitical priesthood, the the things, the way that God had set things up before Jesus came, there uh, were priests that were in the line of Levi and they had to offer sacrifices over and over and over again. Uh, we read that, uh, you know, that just was a temporary thing. But when Jesus came, not only did he offer the sacrifice, not only was he the perfect high priest, but he was the sacrifice. And he only had to do it one time for everyone, one time for the whole world. Those Old Testament priests had to offer sacrifices on behalf of themselves to cleanse themselves because they were likewise sinners. Uh, but Jesus was not. He was perfect in every way. And uh, so we're, we see that, that he is just superior. He's better. And that he loved us so. And he still loves us so that he's done all of those things. So I just love that we get to see that. I want you to hear, and we go here often, so you may be able to recite this right back, but I love this that we see in Hebrews. Um, the writer, uh, because it seems that he was a Jew, uh, goes back and uh, goes all the way back to uh, years and years and hundreds of years before and reminds that the people that in the past God spoke to them through the prophets. You know, that's what we have the, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, we have several books of prophecy. Uh, but in these times, he's spoken to us through his son. Listen to this. He says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, spoke to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, 
through whom also he made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, who, having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they." Oh, there is so much here. It's just these opening four verses of Hebrews. Um, we see that God uh, speaks to his people. Formerly, he spoke through the prophets, but now it's through his son. And when you think about what the gospel writer John wrote about in the beginning was the word and the word was God, and the word was with God, and that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word is Jesus, that spoken word. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. And we know that Jesus is the heir of all things. And we also see here that Jesus was at the in the beginning, just like John says, just like we could tell from Genesis that where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in that um, original Hebrew word for God, it was Elohim, which was a plural word, which tells us that there were was more than what there. So Jesus was with God through in the beginning, and God made the world through him. And that Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature, and he upholds all things. Jesus is is one with God the Father. Jesus has equality with God. Uh, but you know, he laid that down for a time when he came to this earth and, and took on this human form and died for us. Uh, oh, how much he loved us. And how much God the Father loved us that he would ask his only begotten son, his perfect sinless son, to take that on for us. Uh, but, oh, he has exalted him now that at the name of Jesus, every name, uh, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everyone is going to do that at some point, friends, on that last day. And uh, I'm just so thankful for what we see here. But I love the way that this letter opens up. And I just love that he lays the foundation there that Jesus is the exact representation of God. He uh, was there in the beginning. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, or when we started talking about Hebrews, that Jesus is better, he's superior. And so he goes through in a stepwise uh, progression, but he also says, you know, be careful that you don't drift away from this truth. I love this in chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, for this reason, we must, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. And so you'll find in Hebrews that it's a mixture of encouragement, explanation, exhortation, in other words, encouraging and spurring one another on, but it's also, there's some warnings in there, and this is very important, um, but you'll, um, you may recall, because we've talked about the law a great deal throughout this podcast, and, you know, what was in that Old Testament law, and how it, how important it was to the, um, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jews, that was, that was their code. That's what they were supposed to be following. Um, but many thought that their righteousness came from following the law. But like Paul said, he said, if it hadn't have been for the law, I wouldn't have known what sin was. But when Jesus came, he was the end of the law for righteousness for all who would believe. And Everything was summed up in him. And so I love that. And this Hebrew writer goes back to say, you know, Jesus was e is even greater than Moses, which would have just seemed uh, radical at that time. Uh, but Moses had spoken of one that would come after him, you know. And um, then in about from five through eight, the writer really starts to introduce this concept of Jesus being the great high priest. And he goes back 
and forth, and he talks about this priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. Now, you'll remember, and and I'm giving you this background because if you haven't thought about it for a while, it can be a little confusing, I think, if or it would be, it has been for me, unless I think through this in a stepwise progression. Um, But we know that when that uh, priesthood was set up by God, It was the Levitical priesthood. In other words, God chose the tribe of Levi, which was um, the descendants of Levi, one of Jacob's or Israel's sons. He chose them to be the ones that would be the priest and who would take care of the tabernacle and the furnishings and all the worship and that sort of thing. They were supposed to be the ones in that family who who were in charge of that. And why did it go all the way back to Levi? Well, Moses and Aaron were sons of a Levite man and woman. And so that's where that starts. And so when God first made that um, that declaration while they were in the wilderness, um, Aaron was going to be, you know, the first priest, Aaron and his sons. And so it comes down through that lineage. But what we read about was way back before that in Genesis, that Abraham, before he had Isaac, before Isaac had Jacob, and before Jacob had his 12 sons, Abraham met uh, this priest and king, Melchizedek, that they didn't know who who his lineage was, where he came from, or anything like that, and Abraham paid tithes to him. He was on a higher level, um, and uh, we don't know much more than that, but we know that King David talks about Melchizedek also in his Psalms. And you can read about that in Psalm 110. We read that they he's quoting, that writer of this letter to the Hebrews is quoting that in chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. And why is that a big deal there? It's because, you know, the original priesthood after the law was given had to be through the through Aaron's lineage, through the Levites. But Jesus is from a different He's from a different lineage. He is a priest in a different order, that of Melchizedek, that we don't completely understand. But God, through his Holy Spirit, had inspired David to write about it. He, um, just like he inspired David to write other things about Jesus. When I think about, if you look at Psalm 22, and it talks about the uh, the suffering um, and which is just clearly exactly what happened with uh, the Lord Jesus. Um, But in this chapter 7, he goes back in more detail and talks about the difference in the two uh, priestly lines and explains that Jesus is uh, truly in that different order. He's a different one. So I want you to hear this. Um, Remember, we talked about that the priest had, in the Levitical system, had to make um, sacrifices for themselves. They had to be cleansed themselves before they could offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And so I want you to hear this starting in chapter 7, verse 23, and then we'll read forward to uh, the verse for our verse for the day. It says, And the former priest, on the one hand, existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. In other words, there were lots of priests in that family of Levi, and they couldn't keep going forever and ever because their term ended when they died or they got too old. He says, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. I just love the way that the Holy Spirit inspired this writer to explain that. And then in verse 28, for the law, that Levitical law, appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And then here's our verse for the day at the beginning of chapter 8. 
Now, the main point in what is being said is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And I'm going to read a little past it. A minister in the holy places and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. I just love that. So this writer is explaining the difference between the Levitical priesthood and Jesus, uh, who is better, like we've talked about. His is a completely different, he's on a completely different level. He doesn't have to offer sacrifices over and over again. He um, does this continually. He never dies. His term never expires. He makes that intercession. I love this, that we read In chapter 7, verse 25, where it says, Therefore he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is just continually interceding for us. He is our the one who uh, stands before the Father on our behalf. And like we read in just a few chapters before where we find ourselves today in Hebrews 4, he can do that because he walked in in the flesh. He was tempted in every way as we are yet did not sin. Listen to this in 4.14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. In other words, hold fast to this truth of the gospel. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, being able to deal great gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated just as for the people to also offer sacrifices for the sins in the same way for himself. But friends, it wasn't so with Jesus because he never sinned, even though he walked in in a, uh, the flesh, even though he was tempted in every way as we are. So when we look at our verse for the day, now the main point in what is being said is this, we have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the of the majesty in the heavens, and that's where he is right now, a minister in the holy places in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. That is our Jesus. He is the one interceding on our behalf. And friends, we wouldn't have a chance if he were not doing that. And that is why he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. He's He's the one way to the Father. He has made a way for us to be able to be made right with the Father. It's not anything of, on our own. It's not any righteousness. It's not enough good works that we can do. We can't pay enough money. We can't feed enough uh, people or clothe enough uh, people or do anything like that because all of us have sinned. Um, But because of what Jesus has done, if we believe in him, uh, he covers us in his righteousness. Our righteousness, the righteousness is imparted to us and we are justified based on our faith, not on anything else. And it's because of this great high priest, uh, this Jesus. And aren't we thankful? Can you thank him for what he does for us? Can you thank him for what he has done for the whole world and just uh, give God the praise and the glory and the honor and the thanksgiving that he made a way for us to be made right so that we could have life eternal with him. Give him the thanks and praise for that. Blessings to you, friends. Until next time.